Jen, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, well, I don't mind. Um, I guess I would have to agree with Brian on many, many fronts, which is to be open to the opportunities as they come up for you and to be aware of, um, to not be sort of stuck into a way of thinking about what you might do or not do, um, because life, one of the best things someone ever said to me was, um, best laid plans, life always has something better in store for you than you could have planned for yourself, and I think that's true. Um, but thinking about the things that were discussed this morning, um, I am an Australian um, lawyer, I call myself a human rights lawyer, I think I am. Um, I practiced in Australia, so I admitted and practiced in Australia, and then moved to the UK to do postgraduate work, and then I've been practicing uh, law in London, which has a very sort of international um, community and a very international aspect of practice if you want to make it that way. Um, in the last two years, I um, became involved in advising and defending Joint Assange and WikiLeaks, both in advising them in relation to um, the publication of material from the Iraq war logs onwards. Um, so I started working with them and acting for them as their external legal counsel in October 2010, and also acted for Joyan in the earlier stages of the extradition, extradition proceedings with respect to the, the um, alleged, alleged sexual offences in Sweden and the European arrest warrant case. It's still ongoing, and we had a Supreme Court judgment last week. Thinking about some of the um, challenges that we face as social justice or human rights lawyers, um, the two that sort of stuck out for me, or the two themes I think that came out this morning, was um, this constant reiteration about an approach to the law, which is that law is only one small part of a strategy. And secondly, about the challenges that we face in terms of lack of resources, and taking on large systemic problems, and, of, and most often than not the government or major corporations who have significant power. Each of those issues in their own way have been quite prominent, I think, for me as a lawyer defending um, Assange and WikiLeaks over the last two years. In particular, the use of the media and public advocacy as a strategy and as a tool as a lawyer in circumstances like the one that Julian found himself in. Um, I like to do a public perception test when I talk about WikiLeaks. How many of you in this room think WikiLeaks um, is illegal? Yeah. That's, a, that's actually really impressive. Most of the time when I sit into a room, at least half the people put their hand up. Um, one of the things that, imagine, imagine defending a client when, who has, I don't know if anyone else has, defending a client when you have key members of the US um, political sphere calling for his assassination. Um, trying to explain in clear and comprehensible terms why what they're doing is not illegal. Um, trying to respond, uh, the word rape is one word, and it takes me at least half an hour to describe to you why it's not in particular circumstances of this case. Um, and how do you deal with this sort of, with the, with the mass of media coverage on a particular issue? How as a lawyer you try in some ways to confront that? Um, also a lack of resources issue. So working with an activist organisation like WikiLeaks, it is a movement um, more than an organisation. Um, it is a, an organisation that is a not-for-profit media organisation that's been cut off from 96% of its income through the financial services blockade. Has anyone heard of or is, are you familiar with the blockade that WikiLeaks has been subjected to? Um, in December 2010, um, there was a period in which, just to give you a sense of what it's like to be a lawyer working for WikiLeaks, there was two of us at that time. Um, in the same week, we were negotiating the publication of Cablegate. We were, we had received an Interpol, uh, Julian was subjected to an Interpol red notice for the, uh, for the matters in Sweden. A European arrest warrant came in soon after that. His bank accounts were frozen, and Visa, Mastercard, PayPal, Western Union implemented a complete ban on any any uh, electronic transfers to WikiLeaks in the space of about ten days. Since that time, there's been no. The U.S. Treasury has determined that there's no reason, no legal reason to block this WikiLeaks. There is no official government uh, ban or law outlawing donations to WikiLeaks. But we have big, massive corporations who have monopoly on international transactions 
refusing to process payments to WikiLeaks into their bank account. Why? Because of a, a letter that the US State Department wrote to Julian and I, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but which basically um, infers illegal conduct. And these, these companies came out and said that WikiLeaks encourages sources to disclose information in breach of law. Every media organisation on the planet has a website, or any sophisticated large media organisations generally have a website where you can submit, um, where they request and actively solicit in some ways, um, confidential submissions that may or may not have been, um, that the person who discloses them was or may or may not have access to, that was illegal but in the public interest. Um, but WikiLeaks is subjected to a blockade. How do you as a lawyer confront that? Try finding a law firm with financial services experience who is not conflicted out of taking a case or politically will not take a case against the world's biggest financial organisations. So rather, if it were the government that implemented the ban, you would have a situation where you could constitutionally challenge that ban. Or judicially, in, in our terms, in a, in a common law jurisdiction, judicial review. Um, but because it, there's no specific government action, even though we suspect and we know in certain circumstances there were telephone calls made by particular politicians to major corporations to cut them off, um, we are left with a situation where we're fighting on terms of services which are notoriously difficult to, um, to get around. You don't have a right to financial services. And yet these companies are affecting an economic censorship that the government itself could not implement. Um, but what's your cause of action? How do you deal with these big corporations? And this is just one of the sort of rather large um, and quite frightening um, experiences that you can have working with act particularly controversial um, activist organisations. And I don't think I think the WikiLeaks case is in some ways without precedent because of the scale of the international controversy and the scale of the persecution levelled against this organisation. But imagine if. Amnesty or Greenpeace were cut off from donations by Visa or Mastercard because their actions were considered too controversial. Greenpeace actively goes out to break the law in order to protest. They board whaling ships. They trespass onto land, civil disobedience, which is technically a breach of the law. But they're not cut off from their donations. And WikiLeaks is. And so these are some of the, the controversies that we've had to deal with. But as a lawyer acting in the case, I've also had to um, Worn quite a lot of pressure and controversies myself, and this is something that, as lawyers working in this field and working for controversial clients, is a, can be a reality of the work that you do. Um, because of, <coughs> I've been the subject of a lawyer's rights watch complaint that was written to Harold Coe and to Hillary Clinton because of the way in which um, the U.S. government handled their correspondence between us um, as lawyers for Assange and the U.S. government. I wrote, a I sent a letter to the U.S. ambassador with a cover note enclosing a letter from Julian to the U.S. government, um, advising them that they were going to publish the cables. But the U.S. government had been going around uh, briefing foreign governments, briefing NGOs, saying that this is going to put people at risk, this is going to put national security at risk. Um, you know, this is the sky is going to fall. And so Julian wrote to the ambassador. I get a, a note from him over a group to chat saying, "Can you please?" communicate this to the ambassador. So I printed, off, I printed off the letter. He was in hiding um, in the UK. I didn't even know where he was at the particular time. I just knew how to contact him. And I was like, well, it's a blank letter. I can't really send off a blank letter from Julian Assange to the US ambassador. It could have come from anyone. So I put a cover note on it and sent it over. Uh, a day later, we got a letter back from the State Department. And the letter was addressed to me, attorney to Julian Assange, WikiLeaks at my law firm address, but not specifying on the letter that WikiLeaks was not at my law firm. And it st started, Dear Ms. Robinson and Mr. Assange, you were about to publish material that was received in breach of US law. You are about to put at risk lives. You are about to put at risk military operations. Um, you are about to risk international cooperation that's necessary for the prevention of terrorism. So that letter is highly inappropriate. How many of you, <laughs> how many lawyers in the room have heard it have? had a letter jointly addressed <laughs> to you and your client. <laughs> Absolutely inappropriate. Not only did they do it, they then leaked it to the press. Now, working for WikiLeaks, you can't complain about anything being leaked. <laughs> <laughs> and I made that very, very clear. But 
the clear inference from that and the concern that was raised by Human Lawyers Rights Watch Canada was, and their conclusion was, the inescapable conclusion to be reached from that very fundamental breach of lawyer attorney client protocol by Harold Coe, who knows better, was to put pressure on me to interview the jury's right to be defended. The inescapable their words, inescapable conclusion was at a time when Julian was being um, called to be assassinated um, that they had intended to put my personal safety at risk by sending that letter and publishing it in the way that they did by making exaggerated um, allegations, exaggerated and unsubstantiated allegations, not just against my client, but also against me as his lawyer. Since that time, um, there was, has anyone heard about the HB Gary scandal? the smear campaign directed at WikiLeaks. Once Bank of America heard, and some contractors working around, heard that WikiLeaks was about to release information about Bank of America, um, a law firm called Hunter and Williams, anybody know that? Basically, Department of Justice lawyers, um, but external lawyers, went, were working with and solicited some uh, a strategy from a private contractor called H.B. Gary and two others about how to undermine and smear WikiLeaks. There was a graph of people that were um, listed as being either part of the organisations or supporters. My name was on that graph as attorney for. Glenn Greenwald's name was on that graph as a uh, um, known to be journalist who has written, um, I'm not positively, <coughs> but I guess positively about what WikiLeaks is doing, um, but has seemed to be supportive of the transparency efforts. In that document, it said, um, we will engage, for $2 million a month, we will engage in a smear campaign against these named individuals in order to discredit the organisation and those associated. And I'll quote what the document said, which is rather insidious, but I was too busy at the time dealing with the stuff which I went to worry about my own issue. This is, this is how they described us. These are established professionals that have a liberal bent, but ultimately most of them, if pushed, will choose professional preservation over cause. Such is the mentality of most business professionals. <laughs> 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 so there's a few things you might want to take issue with in this document. That a private contractor would pitch a program where they would knowingly seek to discredit people associated with an activist organisation, including their lawyer. If pushed, what do you think if pushed means? Mm -hmm. If pushed will choose professional preservation over cause. <laughs> but then also I was quite offended that they would ultimately uh, <laughs> choose professional preservation over cause. I was saying like, if pushed hard enough. That was sort of their smear campaign. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly right, exactly. So, and I mean that's not the end of it. I've had issues travelling since that time because of my, I think, because of my association with with WikiLeaks, which have, um, the, the travel issues have been very similar to that, that have been directed at others that I know that are in other ways to the with WikiLeaks, um, being stopped at airports. Um, these are issues that as a, a lawyer defending activists, unfortunately, in some circumstances, we have to, um, we have to deal with. I think it's rather unusual, this is an unusual case, and it's not in every case, but as people keep asking me, and I think that most human rights lawyers would say this, is that people say, how do you continue to do it? because it's the right thing to do, and that if the people we act for have the moral courage to do these things, then surely we have the moral courage to stand up and defend them. Um, but this area of the law is not, um, is not without its challenges. Um, resources is obviously an issue. I work for WikiLeaks as pro bono. I do it because I think it's the right thing to do. Um, and that if they didn't have lawyers like me and the guys at CCR who, do, who are able to act for free, then they wouldn't have anyone. Um, but I guess to sort of think about, I'm happy to answer more questions about, about it, but to think about all of you when I was at your stage, I was so desperate to work in human rights work and I didn't know how or what the path was and how to get there. And all I'll say is that do what you believe in, continue to do what you believe in, seek out people that are doing the sorts of work that you want to do and try to work with them and be open to opportunities because they will come. But it's not easy, it will require lots of volunteering, it will require taking those difficult decisions between high paying jobs and a less paying job. But in my experience, it's been worth it every single time. If you are moved by feeling good about what you do, then it's an easy decision. <laughs>